Um, so I do have a little PowerPoint I could talk through to go over a few of the concepts from the chapter if you'd like. Um, but also, if, with, especially with just a small number of us, if there's like something in particular, like a problem you were working on, um, or if you want to look at, somebody had mentioned one of the Excel uh, in an email, and, I, and I'd be happy to kind of go over that. I think, I think the, that where it's like just a blank Excel, and it's like, do a multi-step income statement. And you're like, well, there's so much stuff in a multi-step <laughs> income statement. Like, how do I begin to set this up? Um, mm -hmm. I That's would be where I'm at. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I kind of like, what's weird is like, if you had to do it in real life, you would just do it. You wouldn't be afraid that it was like, oh, there's like, because you'd be making the, the financial statement to present to, to whoever needed it. Whereas here you're like, no, there's a right way they want me to do it. And you like, feel like I, for me, at least there's like this little dissonance where I'm like afraid to like move forward, not knowing what their, the expectation is. Um, so we can take a look at that too. Brian, did you have anything? Is it, is it Brianne? Yeah, it's Brianne. Okay. I didn't want you to be like, no, it's Brianne. I can't believe you or whatever. So, uh. <laughs> no, you're fine. It's spelled weird. Um, the only question I really had, well, I don't even know how to um, state my question on the number 13 homework. Mm -hmm. um so I don't know this just kind of confused me so filling out like the perpetual um first in first out and the last in first out like mm -hmm. I thought I got it but then like the one because there were like three different questions on that and the one I got right so the first thing on it was the beginning inventory and the second thing was a purchase and the two I got wrong it was beginning inventory and then a sale first and for okay. some reason that's where I went wrong so I don't okay. know what I did wrong there <laughs> Okay. So, so, okay. So we could take a look at those two things. Would you, would it still be valuable for me to kind of do a quick little overview that I had put together or would that, do you think it'd be better to just jump straight to those two questions? Um, the Excel and that number 13. And if we have time left over, do the overview. The post, I'm good with post whatever view. works for everybody else. <laughs> yeah, it works for me too. I mean, I, I have questions about both the number 13 homework and the Excel. So okay. you know, I'm sure your presentation probably covers a lot of it. It does. And I, and I, and I did add some videos. I don't know if anybody saw those that, so in the additional study resource link I have, I've been adding videos um, for each chapter. Um, and so there are videos walking through first and first out, last and first out, weighted average. Um, and I try to keep them short, you know, they're 10 to 12 minute little videos on each one. So that might be another resource if you get stuck, but I'll definitely go through them. Um, anyway, yes, yeah. Kim. Where, where those videos are, or where the sure. additional resources are, because I'm, yeah. I'm on the page right now, I'm looking for it. All right, so let me, I'm gonna go to, let me get in the right course. I'm gonna go to modules. And then, oh, student resources. Okay. Up here, I think under student resources, yeah, I put Brother Fox's additional study resources. And so, like, all it is, because <laughs> I'm lazy and I'm not going to keep a website, is I just do like a Google Doc and then I link stuff. So, like, so yeah, there's an inventory costing assumptions, which kind of goes over all of them. And then a, a, a first in, first out example, a last in, first out example, and a weighted average example that may be helpful um, to check That's out. Awesome. Thank you. Um, because I was like, you know what? I got nothing to do. I think I'll just make some videos like that. Um, no, because they're really helpful sometimes. I, at least for me, when I'm learning, like that I could like watch it even a couple times or like watch one section of it a couple times um, or slow it down because I know I talk fast. Um, anyway, so let me just real quick, I'm going to pull up. I think I just uh, I got like 10 or 12 slides here real fast. And they might help. Let me move. The downside to Zoom when you're on a laptop is like that little menu bar like takes up a big chunk of stuff, of real estate. Um, all right. So just a couple things. So remember that your inventory asset account. Okay. When, when you have, so you'll have an asset account called inventory. Sometimes people confuse it with the actual physical inventory sitting on the shelf, which it does represent, but what it really represents is the cost of that inventory. And so 
not only would you be recording like what you actually paid the supplier for the inventory, but you mother might also include what if you paid for any shipping or any storage or any insurance or any, you know, the cost of importing it through through the ports. All of those costs would be added to what you paid for it and would be part of the cost of your inventory. OK, and, and, and any discounts you got on it would be subtracted from that. And so that's important to remember, because sometimes people are like kind of weirded out for some reason by the idea of when they take a discount and then you you credit the inventory account and people are like, whoa, but you still have the same amount of stuff on your shelf. And I'm like, yeah, we're not talking about the physical stuff. We're talking about the cost of the stuff sitting on our shelf. So that's really what inventory asset represents is the cost of our inventory. Um, so there's kind of four, there's really, there's three inventory cost flow assumptions and four ways we typically deal with the cost of inventory. Um, the one is not an assumption, but it's, it's, it's where we actually are able to track the, you know, which product we're selling. So if you think about it, like for some products, like if a car dealership, it's really easy for them to know exactly what each unit costs them. And when they sell it to know which unit they sold because each car is stamped with an individual vehicle identification number they know exactly which car they sold when they buy it and then put mechanics work into it they know exactly what their costs are in the car so they would use what's called the specific identification method which the reason it's not listed here is because it's not an assumption it's knowing exactly which item you happen to be selling at a given time but for businesses that sell say large numbers of of relatively homogenous items, um, like something like uh, my mother owned a, a, a small store and we would sell canned goods. So like, let's say if we considered cans of peas, we can't, when I sell a can of peas to a customer, I don't know which inventory shipment they came in. And if we had multiple inventory shipments with different costs, like maybe in, in January, we bought a case of peas and they cost 55 cents a can. And then in, in, in uh, March, we bought another case and they cost 70 cents a can. Well, then when I sell a can to a customer, I don't know if I sold them the one that cost me 55 cents or the one that cost me 70 cents. It's, it's pretty impossible for me to keep track of that. And especially if you think of a business on the scale of like Walmart or something where they sell massive quantities through all of their stores. So because it's so hard, to know which units you're selling, we've come up with these assumptions um, where we're just going to use a consistent process to, to make an estimated guess of which item we're selling. The first type of assumption is called the first in first out assumption. In that assumption, we always assume that whatever items we purchase first are the first items we sell. The second is called last in first out. That's where we assume the, the the last items we purchased, the most recently purchased items are the first ones we sell. Uh, and then the, the third is called weighted average, where we say, well, I, since I don't know which item I'm selling, I'm just going to take an average cost and use that when I make a sale. So these are the three inventory cost flow assumptions. So here's some information for an example. Um, and this is, a, looks like a mountain bike company called Trekking. Um, and you can see on August 1st, they had 10 bikes or bicycles in their inventory that cost them $91. And then on August 3rd, they purchased 15 more at a cost of 106. On August 14th, they sold 20 units for $130 a piece. August 17th, they purchased 20 more units for 115. August 28th, 10 more units at 119. And then on August 30th, they sold 23 more units. So that's a record of all their purchases and sales for the whole month. So we know that they sold, that they, that they had 10 units when the month started. They purchased 45 additional units during the month um, and that they sold 43 units. Um, and we know if then that if they had 10 and they purchased 45, that means they had 55 available for sale. If they sold 43, it means they'll have 12 units left over at the end of the month. So all that information is presented to us here. The question is, when we want to do at the end of the month, do a report and say, well, what was our cost of goods sold? And what is the value of that ending inventory? 
it, it, the answer is it depends on which units we actually sold, or if we can't track by specific unit, then it depends on which assumption process we use. So the first, like I said, is it's called specific identification. This would be where we put some sort of a tracking tag or something, and we know exactly which bikes we sold. In this case, they know that in the August 14th sale, they sold eight of the bikes that cost $91 and 12 that cost 106. So they would know exactly how much the cost was. On the 30th, they know exactly which bikes they sold so they can record exactly how much their cost is. Um, and so then we would know our cost of goods sold was 4,582 and the, the value of the ending inventory is 1,408. So the, the first method, if, if it's like a company like this that seriously only makes like 40 sales a month, it would be pretty easy to, to, to do the specific identification method. Um, but, you know, most companies hope to sell more than 40 some odd units a month. All right. So the second assumption is called first in, first out. And again, on that one, we just assume that the first units we purchase are going to be the first ones we sell. So all we're going to do is record our purchases as they happen and then keep track. So at the beginning of the month, we had 10 that cost 91 a piece. Then when we bought 15 more at 106, we now have 10 units that cost 91 plus 15 units that cost 106. And then when we make a sale on August 14th, we have to ask, ask the question, well, which ones am I going to assume I sold? And with first out, I'm always going to assume the oldest ones. So I'm going to account for all of the oldest units first. So if we sold 20 units on August 14th, we would say we must have sold all 10 of the oldest ones or all 10 of the $91 units, plus 10 more of the newer ones. Um, those were 106. So then we can figure out what our cost of goods sold is. And we know which five units we still have remaining are the the, the newer $106 units. Then we record our purchases and we just keep track of them in order. Then when we make a sale, again, we ask that question, well, which ones am I gonna consider that I sold? And again, we would say the oldest. So the oldest are these $106 units. So if I sold 23 units, I would assume we sold all five of those plus 18 of the $115 units, leaving us with two more of the $115 units and 10 of the, of the, the newest $119 units. So does that, any questions about that? So that's first in, first out. But I think I understand the concept of the first in, first out. What I'm not understanding on the thir week 13 homework is how it's supposed to look in the actual module. Like okay. that part is confusing. Okay, well, like I said, I'll, I'll go through this in just a few more minutes and then we'll go look at that one specifically, okay? Um, because yeah, sometimes they lay out these little records slightly differently. Um, so here's last in, first out. And again, I'll try to go through it quickly. Stop me if you have a question. But again, we have 10 units at the beginning of the month. We, we buy 15 more. So now we have 25 units. Uh, and then on August 14th, we make a sale. And again, our question is, well, which units am I selling? So with last in first out, we're going to assume always that we that what we're selling is the, the most recently purchased units. So if we sold 20 units, we would think, oh, I sold all 15 of these $106 units plus five of the older units. So 15 at 106, five at 91 gives us a cost of goods sold. And the five that are remaining are still the, the older units. Then we add our purchases on the 17th and 28th. And then on the 30th, when we make a sale, same question, which ones are we assuming we sold? And again, if we sold 23 units, we'd assume it was the, the, the 23 most recently purchase, purchased units, which would be 10 of the 119 plus another 13 of the $115 units, which would leave us with still uh, seven of the $115 units and five of the $91 units. So that's last in, first out. So the only difference between the two Still, each time you make a sale, you're just trying to ask, well, which units am I assuming I sold? And the only difference is with first in, first out, I'm assuming I sold the first purchased or the oldest units. 
And with last in first out, I'm assuming I sold the last units or the most recently purchased units. So the third one's the hardest uh, for a lot of people at least, which is weighted average. So I actually like it better. I think it's easier in some ways. So again, we have beginning balance. So what we do with weighted average is every time we make a purchase, we recalculate our average cost. And I think all these arrows make it seem more confusing than it is. All I'm really doing is saying, well, I had $910 worth of inventory and then I purchased $1,590 worth of inventory. So if I add 910 plus 1,590, I see that I now have $2,500 worth of inventory. And then the same thing, I had 10 units, I purchased 15 more. So now I have 25 total units. So then I just take the total cost of 2,500, divide it by 25 and say my average cost was $100 per unit. Then when I make a sale, I just use that average cost. So I say I sold 20 units on August 14th, multiply that by the average cost of 100 and say my cost of goods sold was 2,000. And then, uh, and then what I have remaining is five units times that average cost of 100, so $500 worth of units. Then, On August 17th, when I make another purchase, I just recalculate my average. So now I said, well, I had $500 worth and I'm gonna, and I just purchased 2,300. So I have $2,800 worth of, of inventory after that purchase. I had five units, I'm adding 20. So now I have 25 units. Pick 2,800 divided by the number of units and I get an average cost of 112. Then on the 28th, I make another purchase. I recalculate my average again, just by adding the, again, I had 2,800 worth of inventory. I added 1,190. So now I have 3,390 in inventory. I had 25 units. I added 10. So now I have 35 units. I divide 3,990 by 35 and I get a new average cost of 114. So all we're doing is each time we purchase inventory, we're recalculating the average cost by taking the total cost of our inventory divided by the total number of units of inventory. And then when we make a sale, we just apply that cost, average cost um, of, 20, of 114. So on August 30th, when we sold 23 units, multiply that by $114, which was our average cost at that point. And then to, to calculate our remaining inventory, we take the number of units in inventory, 12, and multiply that by the average cost. And that's it. And so, it's one of those things that like seems a little complicated, but after you do it a few times, you're like, oh, well, I don't know why that was ever so hard. Um, so let's take a look now at the specific problem. Let's look at number 13 on the, what did you say it was on? It's the uh, lesson 13 homework in the McGraw-Hill. Okay. I'll close that. I come here, go to McGraw Hill. And then, is it, let's see, lesson 13 homework, there it is. And no, wait, it's number 13. Now I'm getting confused. Is this it? Yeah, that's the right one. Okay. So which, do you know, is it, is it the whole thing or is it, is it like, should I start at the top here and just kind of talk through it? Yeah, I think at least for me, that would be helpful because like, even though I understand the concept, like knowing what numbers they're expecting me to put inside of this thing is, I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm not sure where to put the numbers. Okay. So, so for, for number one, it tells us to compute the cost of goods for, because uh, uh, cost of goods available for sale and the number of units available for sale. So at, on this first part, there's like no first in, first out or last in, first out. They're just asking us to figure out how many units we have um, and the total cost of the goods. So the way they have it set up here is they want us to do the beginning inventory of 230 units at 5360 
Um, and it doesn't give us the total, so we have to multiply that out, right? 230 times 5360 is 12,328. Then they want us to list our purchases. And so again, we purchased 290 at 5860. We multiply them to get 16,994. We purchase 150 at 6360, et cetera. And then we just add them up. So for that first one, they just want us to kind of end up with what was the total cost of these goods and how many units are there. So sometimes like just being able to see this right here, this left-hand column, like we can do the rest of the problem because the number, it wasn't the concept. It was just like, what do you want from me, McGraw-Hill? Um, and so if you see that they have it set up with the beginning inventory, then purchases, and then the dates of the three purchases, that probably. Um, I, I don't know if it's just, if I'm on the wrong one, but like the, the portion at the top is the same information that I have, but like the. the There's multiple parts on this. Yeah, none of none of that is the same, at least from like what I'm looking at on my screen. Okay. So yeah, one thing I want to talk about our course to our course designers about is they have these problems set up to present in like mixed up order. So when someone says to me, Can you look at number one? And then I pull up number one on mine, it's not the same as it is on yours. So mm -hmm. let's just and that's frustrating um, as far as being able to help. Um, so Maybe it's this one. Honestly, like that, yeah, that part looks more like what I have, but I don't even have like the first box that you were filling in. Which first, what do you mean? The first part where it said like the beginning inventory and the purchases. Yeah, well, I actually just skipped to another problem because I think we were looking at different problems. Gotcha. So that's why I'm trying to find the one that will or do you want to share your screen so maybe we can see it and then make sure yeah, we're looking. All right, let me, I think I have to allow it. Hold on. And then. And to everyone else here, if I'm taking over too much, just let me know if you guys have questions too, please. Please jump in and I don't want right. to take up my time. Well, I mean, we're all working I, on the same stuff. <laughs> yeah, I have the same questions as you. So you're good, Kim. <laughs> Are you guys able to see this screen? I see it. Okay. I've got um, two monitors going, so I want to make sure I'm on the right one. Okay. Yeah, this just says number number one. Yeah. So required so like the beginning inventory it's like obviously it's 190 units uh -huh. hours. um i guess i'm kind of confused because when it gets to the cost of goods sold like the the dates aren't lining up so i and then you know if we're doing the specific identification method i am not sure how to do that when you know my my purchases and my inventory aren't lining up with the uh, the items that are being sold. Okay. Um, let's see. So I'm just I'm looking on my end to make sure I'm comparing. Not to interrupt, sorry, but yeah. um, it took me a minute to figure this out too, Kim. If you look up above. Um, where the chart is and it shows you all the information. Right below it, it says for specific identification, it tells you exactly how much ending inventory you should have for each one. It took me forever to figure yeah, that out. So that thing. might be part of it because it tells you how much you should have left in like each one. I see. Okay, that definitely helps. Thank you. Yeah. So does that, I mean, does that help or, or do you want to? Um, I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen now and you can go back to what you were working on. Cause I think I can probably figure it out from that point. Okay. Um, so I think like, I think this one I just pulled up here is the same problem. Yeah. I hate that they're in different orders. I think it makes it hard to, hard to help when I'm like 
you're looking at number one and I'm looking at number seven and, and we have to like, I have to see yours to figure out which one we're looking at. Um, so yeah, so like, I think this is the same problem. Um, so it says, uh, for specific identification, ending inventory consists of 300 units where 280 are from January 30 purchase, uh, five are from the January 20th purchase, and five are from the beginning inventory. So then we're just going to set this up and say, okay, um, if there was, so our beginning inventory was 190 units that cost us $7. So if our ending inventory only has five, I'm oh, sorry, 15 from the beginning inventory, then we must have sold 175 of those. Um, so for this available for sale, we're really just copying this same information right here, right? 190 units at $7. So if there was 15 left over, then we must have sold 175 of those. We purchased 110 here on January 20th. So it tells us the January 20th, there's only five left from the January 20th purchase. So we had 110 at $6. If there's only five left over. So what I do on these actually is I'll jump over to the ending inventory and just fill this in with that information and then subtract available for sale or ending inventory from available for sale, which will tell me the number of units I actually sold. Does that help? I mean, I think you, like you said, you would have figured that out already, but, but. Yeah, no, that helps a lot. Thank you. Um, and then like on the second one, it's gonna have us do uh, the weighted average method. Um, and again, so we just start with, and this one has goods purchased, cost of goods sold and inventory balance is how they set this one up. So again, I would say I started with 190 units at a cost of $7 a piece. So that was, my inventory balance at the beginning of the month. Then on January 10th, I sold 150 units. And so sometimes it confuses people. It'll say at $16. And so they want to put that somewhere in here. But this table we're keeping here is only concerned with our costs. We're only going to use that sales price, what we sold it to our customer for later, if it asks us to figure out our, our sales revenue so that we can figure out our gross profit. So we're gonna record the 10th, we sold 150 units at $7 because we're using this cost here, which leaves us with 40 units at $7 after that January 10th sale. January 20th, we purchased 110 units for $6 a piece. So I'll record 110 at $6. So I had 40 at seven plus 110 at six. So I'll add up 40 and 10 to get 150 total units. And then I'll add up the total cost, 280 plus 660 to get a total cost of 940. And then divide the 940 by 150 to give myself the new average cost of 627 per unit. Then on the January 25th sale of 130 units, I'll apply that average cost, 130 units at the average cost of 627 leaving me with 20 units at, a, at an average cost of 627. Then on the January 30th purchase, again, I'll record that over here. I'll add up my total cost, add up my total number of units, divide the total cost by the total units to get a new average cost. So that's the process there. Any questions about that process? Thank you, that cleared it up for me. I think I was doing the average wrong. Like I took the whole average for everything rather than like the average at the end of each balance. Okay. Okay, good. And then on first in, first out, you know, again, so here's what we started with, 190 at seven. Um, and then when we make a purchase, it's super easy if we only have inventory purchased or this, you know, all, all from the past. Uh, only one option. We know when we sell 150 that it's going to be of these $7 units, which leaves us with 40 of the $7 units. Then on January 20th, we purchase 110 more. So it's always important that we do them in the right order, like the oldest units first. So 40 at $7, 
plus 110 units at $6. That way, when we go to make our sale on the 25th, they're in order. And we can say, okay, if I sold 130 units on the 25th, I'm going to record that I sold the oldest units first. So I sold all 40 of those $7 units plus 90 of the $6 units, leaving me at the end of the month, or I'm sorry, at the end of that transaction with 20 units left over that are the $6 units. And then a purchase of 280 more. So at that point I have 200 or 20 of the $6 units plus 280 of the 550 units. And then with last in first out, very similar process, except when I make the sale, now I'm assuming I sold the most recently purchased units first. So if I have 190 units, I sell 150 of them. That leaves me with 40 units that cost $7 a piece. I purchase 110, so now I have 40 of the $7 units and 110 of the $6 units. And so to this point, this is identical to first in, first out. It's not till we make a sale. And now we're going to say, well, which units did I sell? Well, this is last in, first out. So I'm assuming I sold, if I sold 130, it was all 110 of those plus 20 of those. And I know, Kim, like you said, you feel pretty confident with this. I just wanted to finish it for others maybe who, who were feeling less so. Um, so um, does, does that help? Is any other questions about this before we look at the Excel problem? Okay, so whoops, that wasn't supposed to happen. My news thing's coming up. So let's take a look. Let's see, was it the Excel? Hold on, I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute so I can get there. Modules. And is it is it the Excel problem that has to do with the uh, the um, the multi step income statement? Is that the one? Yes, um, okay. I kind of like I copied the um, multi step income statement from from the chapter, but I was kind of confused with the first question, like what it was asking specifically. Okay. So let me pull it up here. Just give me a second. Whoa, it like scrolled all big on me there. So let's see, sorry, it's just taking me a minute to get it open. So, okay, let me share now that I got it. All right, so let's see, it says use the following table. So you mean this number one? Yeah, that, I wasn't quite sure what it was asking for. Sure, so, so like for sales, so, so our merchandise available for sale, as an example, okay, is going to be um, any inventory we had. So our inventory at the beginning of the month, plus um, any purchases we made, plus the cost of our freight, minus any purchase returns and allowances, and minus any discounts. So that's what they're asking us to do is to figure out like, okay, uh, what would be, in essence, they're asking us before we recorded any sales, how much merchant, what would be the balance of our merchandise inventory account? So which would be merchandise at the beginning of the period plus purchases, plus the cost of the freight, because we always add that to the cost of our inventory, minus any purchase discounts and purchase returns and allowances. Um, our net sales, similarly, this one I kind of feel like I'm cheating because 
you have the same numbers as me. Whereas on the other one, I can show you the numbers because they're all different, but um, just to show the process here. So net sales is just gonna be our sales minus any sales returns and allowances. And I think that's it. Sometimes it'll be, so, so, so net sales is sales minus sales discounts and minus sales returns and allowances. I don't see any sales discounts on this one. The cost of our merchandise sold. Um, let's see, that's going to be our, if we, we, so cost of, sometimes it's called cost of goods sold, right? But that's going to be, in essence, our available for sale minus our ending inventory. Because if I had 29,200 worth of stuff to sell, and at the end of the month I have 54,000, then 299,200 minus the 54,000 is going to tell me how much stuff I actually sold. So net sales, like I said, is sales minus sales returns and allowances. Does that help? I kind of did it for everybody, but. Yeah, I, I guess I was just confused, like what I was supposed to put in like both of the columns, like the merchandise available column and then the net sales column, if that if that's what it was asking for. So I don't see them like, I'll tell you when I grade them, I'm looking in these shaded fields, okay? So I'm not sure what they want from us there, unless they want us to use it so you shouldn't need to do anything here to 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 calculate those answers okay so I, that I, that begs the question why are they why are those columns there though now that now i want to go look at their answer key and see what they put there i'll have to do that and if there's anything of value i'll i'll add it in the notes when i post this but you don't need that, you know. You don't need anything here to answer these questions. And then here, like I, you know, like I've been getting lots of questions about this. But honestly, it I mean, it tells you here where to look, right? Exhibit five point one three, and you just copy that the way that that's laid out there. Um, you know, really, the only difference. Um, in fact, maybe this will help. Let me. Let me stop sharing for a second and I'll find something that might help real quick or okay, moderately quick if I'm being honest. Why will you not let me do that? Like I'm, I think I'm, I'm going to give a little hint here by giving you guys by filling in So here's the format that this will take, which I think will help um, because I, it seems to me that it's not so much confusion about what, like, like you know where to find the numbers. It's just like, what is all the stuff that goes here? So again, we start with sales, subtract our sales returns and allowance and our sales discounts to give ourselves net sales. And again, we can look right here, we can see 
um, we had sales of 55,000. And then our sales returns and allowances were 4,400. Sales discounts were 900. That would give us our net sales. Our cost of goods sold given to us is 22,500. Sorry, everybody. Apparently we dropped. I think we're back. Can you hear me? Brianne and Nacy. Yes. Nacy. I can hear you. Now. All right. Um, sorry. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what happened there. Um, I don't. My kids. Are, my my kids are in the other room saying it's because our Wi-Fi stinks. I think it's because they're streaming a video or streaming basketball game in there, and someone else is streaming. It, but but I guess I need more bandwidth. Um, anyway, I apologize uh, for that. Let me go back to what I was showing you. And probably need to, it says we're still recording, so that's interesting. Um, Brother Fox, is anything included in the third column? When I was looking at the textbook, it, it only had like the two columns. I didn't see anything in the third column. I guess on this one, it would be the fourth column. Yeah, so um, I think there's more. Th so just so you guys know, like when, when we're doing these, a lot of times different people do them slightly differently. Some people will use two columns. Some people will use three. And I honestly don't care. I'm like, I'm not like, you never get marked down for using like uh, what I think is more efficient. I think two columns is actually more efficient. Um, and so like the, the way they have the answer key laid out, they have three columns and I think it's confusing. So, I mean, what I would recommend the way I would do it, wait, am I still share? No, the sharing dropped. Or I hold on. I mean, I love the technology, but it's a little annoying sometimes. Okay. So the, the way I would do it is I would just be listing, you know, sales here in this column. Um, you know, and then minus these two would give me net sales, which I'd put in that column. Um and I'd have cost of goods sold there and my gross profit there. And then I would have like my sales and supplies expense, selling and selling expense, advertising expense, and then the total of all three of them in that second column. So the short answer is I wouldn't do three columns. I wouldn't use the third column, but the, the way that the, the, the lead instructor made the answer key, he did three columns so he likes them that way. But most of the ones I see in the real world are always two column where the left column is kind of a subtotaling column for, for, for things in like categories, like the different expenses. And then the right column is where that total or subtotal of that area is. Anyway, does having these help like just to see how it's all laid out? Um, and again, then we're just pulling the numbers right out of here because they're given to us up here. And then again, on this one, so they, again, I think it's a little confusing that they, they give us descriptions, company A, company B. Um, and again, what they want from us there is just uh, to put a description of, let's see. Um, like the, let's see how they, I'm actually gonna pull that one up because I wanna see how they have it laid out too. Cause I don't think it's clear from the problem. Yeah, so under descriptions, they have unit price, number of units, and then the total price, less the discount, plus any freight to give you total cost. So that's all they're asking you to do is compare the two side by side. But again, I don't feel like from the information they give us, I don't feel like what they want in this description column or how they want it laid out is clear. So I just wanted to show you guys that too. 
Okay. I think we're running close to the end of time. Is there is there anyone else who had a question or, or a different question than the ones we've looked at? or some concept that I thought I explained, but that you're like, no, I really need you to try to hit that from a different angle because it didn't really help me or something like that. That's okay too. I wouldn't be offended. Not gonna lie, I could probably use like another hour, but I know we don't have that kind of time. So I'll, I'll leave my questions at that for today. Okay. And it's, yeah, I, and like I said, that there are the videos out there. Those might be helpful. Um, and if you need to, I mean, like I, I'm totally willing to, to you know schedule a time one-on-one -on -one to go over something if you need it um especially if you've you know if you've tried it and you're getting frustrated then um then i'm okay with that too thank you i appreciate that and thank you for the videos oh no problem okay then why don't we uh why don't we end uh with a prayer i i will not call on a specific person and call them out because that was a mistake on my part sorry um anybody uh volunteer to offer a, a a closing prayer for us i can do it awesome thank you our dear heavenly father we thank you for this day we thank you for the opportunity to come here tonight and to be able to learn what we needed to learn and please us that we can continue to do well in our schoolwork and we thank you for all that has done for us. And we love you and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody. And I will I'll post this too to the to the announcements. Um, and have a great night. Thank you for your time.